welcome to the second episode of MTM Update. It's the English speaking format in which we uh, take a view about global media topics. And today we will discuss the freedom of press in Europe and especially in Malta. And I'm very happy to welcome Matthew Caruana Galizia. Matthew, you're an investigative journalist in Malta and you are the son of Daphne Caruana Galizia. Um, who's well known now because um, she uh, was murdered in a car with a car bomb in 2017. Um, she was investigating uh, the Panama Papers, um, crimes which were connected to your government at that time and which put a lot of pressure on the government. Uh, you were involved by that time. Were you aware that something like that could happen in Europe and in Malta? Yes and no, because I had the feeling that something was going to have to give. My mother was, my mother was exposing high-level corruption and the reaction from the Maltese government was to attack her rather than attacking the corruption she was exposing. And of course, I knew this couldn't go on. Um, their only options were to either stop my mother or stop the corruption. And it ended with um, the people my mother was exposing stopping her, unfortunately. And the lesson from it is that it could have all been avoided if the government of Malta took action based on the evidence in the Panama Papers and the evidence of corruption that my mother was exposing in 2016, over a year before her murder. It, it hasn't even done that almost five years later. The name of your mother kind of became a synonym for the fight for freedom of press because um, there was a lot of pressure on her. She was, um, she was not writing for the newspaper. She said she's writing for the blog because she had the feeling that for the uh, great newspapers, there is a kind of censorship, not speaking openly about what the, um, what the government is doing. They were selling national IDs, for example, by that time, which wasn't a crime actually, but it, it, it wasn't known. The, the thing is that, um, the, and this happens a lot in different companies, that me, the media creates a blind spot for itself. And this, this blind spot is created by an extremely strict adherence to principles of objective journalism that when you stick to them so strictly, you end up not not even scratching the surface of what ought to be exposed. So the government of Malta announced that it would be selling passports for cash and newspapers broke the story because that was objectively the fact. But no one dared go beyond that um, into the subjectivity of it. It was, it was my mother who did that. It was her. And this is why the attacks focused on her, because she went beyond the superficial. Um, she didn't see her job as to just report what the government has announced, full stop, um, but to keep digging deeper and to keep pulling up the thread. Digging deeper, it's especially about who bought the national ID passports and that is actually a topic which concerns um, or which should concern all of Europe because um, criminals who were um, who were on the list for example during the crim crisis a lot of people were on the on the blacklist not to get into the EU people like that bought passports so it's a corruption which had an um, expand on all over Europe. One hundred percent, but the it it's worse than that because the the whole passports for cash scheme 
is based on a simple fraud. Citizenship within EU member states requires a meaningful presence or a meaningful relationship as sorry as well as a meaningful relationship with the member state but fundamentally it requires a meaningful presence in the member state now of course the Maltese government is aware of this requirement and it assured the European Commission that this requirement was being fulfilled but what actually happens the the government of Malta, along with the companies like Henley and Partners and a lot of other agents that sell the Maltese passports, participate in a fraud whereby they sell the passport, they create a rental agreement or a property purchase agreement, and they they use fraud to make it seem as though the person who bought the passport is actually living in that property and is actually visiting the country and spending time here and conducting business here and so on. Whereas in the ma vast majority of the cases, this is not happening. Um, in fact, these agents have agreements with property managers so that they, for example, go and turn on the taps in the empty property or leave the lights on for a day to run up a utility bill so that then they can show they can use this bill to make it seem as though someone is actually living there when it's not actually the case so all of these um all it this citizenship is being granted on the basis of this very simple fraud and that is fundamentally what is wrong with it your mother was investigating it and after her death um her research became a lot of more um, input from all over the world. Um, would, you, um, would you want more engagement from other European countries? Certainly. The, the thing is that we, we want a doc engagement. So um, we want uh, a joint investigation by EU member states. Because the thing is that the money laundering scheme that my mother was investigating was purposefully designed so that if anyone tried to start investigating it, they would find it almost impossible because they would have to go from one country to the next following the trail of evidence. And it is impossible for Malta's tiny police force to do this without serious cooperation from other EU member states, especially other EU member states where evidence is held or other EU member states that have the ability to obtain more evidence. But we also want permanent changes to the system or to the ways in which evidence is exchanged. It's currently based on ad hoc cooperation or on very antiquated mechanisms like rogatory letters, which are letters sent from one diplomat to another requesting assistance. It's a mechanism from the Victorian era. And this makes investigation so slow that by the time you obtain any evidence, it's already too late. Did uh, something change after the death of your mother? You created the Daphne project where you um, do a researching network with other journalists? The Daphne project was created by Forbidden Stories, which is an organization set up specifically to continue the work of journalists who have been murdered or imprisoned. And we're extremely grateful for their support because without that, we would have not been in a position to continue my mother's investigations. We're so busy fighting for justice and spending time in court that it's just impossible for us to do that work. And the members of the Daphne Project did it and they did it extremely well. The death of your mother um, is still on trial. The wire puller um, is not um, sentenced yet. The government who was connected to the crimes, they stepped back, Joseph Muscat stepped back, I think two years it took them, even though the protest started uh, with the death of your mother. Do you have hope that things will go better in Malta or do you don't see any change? 
I always have hope that things will get better. And if I didn't, then I wouldn't be doing this work. I would have just given up. So, yes, I do hope that things will get better. I think um, Malta has reached a critical point um, where society has changed and is no longer as tolerant of corruption as it was before. Of course, it has not changed enough, but it's reached a point where um, I think we have a critical mass of people who care about these issues. After um, the death of your mother, the, her laptop was investigated by the uh, German Federal Police Department. Did you have trust in them? I, the German Federal Police Department are... I mean, it technologically in a better position than most other police forces in Europe. And at the time, or at the time of my mother's murder, we were dealing with a number of issues with the investigation, including the fact that the deputy police commissioner responsible for the investigation was a friend of it turns out the the person who is now being prosecuted for masterminding my mother's murder and also the husband of a government minister um whom my mother also investigated so we had a big issue with that and in fact we filed a right a human rights case and the court found that um, having this deputy police commissioner in charge of the investigation was a violation of our rights. Whereas that, that is obviously not the case for other police forces in Europe. I mean, it's unlikely that another European police force, especially the BKA, is going to have a corrupt relationship with the people that my mother was investigating. Not just unlikely, impossible. Would you wish for more engagement or more political pressure from other European countries on the Maltese government? Yes, of course, because the, the Maltese government likes to say that people like me have uh, an agenda. That's the word they use in quotes. And of course I have an agenda, it's justice for my mother. But what they mean is a kind of partisan political agenda. But that, that's one, highly offensive and insulting and also extremely cynical because they know it to not be true. Um, and they will also admit that things only started to change in Malta the moment there was pressure and international pressure on the government for things to be done differently. And it's crucial that that pressure keeps up because the moment it lets off, then that's the moment that things go back to the way they were. It's like I said earlier, we've reached a point where we have this window of opportunity to change our country forever or to go back to the way things were before. And if international pressure lets up now, then I'm quite certain that things will just go back to the way they were before. It's really important that this is kept up until the investigation is concluded in a proper way, the public inquiry is concluded in a proper way, um, that people are convicted for the murder, that all the people responsible are convicted, that all the people responsible for the corruption my mother was investigating are also convicted, and that the country implements the reforms that the Council of Europe has said it has to implement. The European Parliament created an award for freedom of press uh, to honor your mother. What do you think of something like that? Is it helpful? Yes, of course it's helpful. I mean, it's one, it's, it's a huge honor. Um, I mean, I, uh, I used to look at, um, people who 
who won prizes like that or people whom prizes like that i i used who, whom prizes like that are named after i mean i used to look at those people um with a sense of huge admiration and i still do and now my mother is one of them um which leaves me feeling incredibly proud um and it does help because it it is recognition and that recognition offers a degree of protection on the list of reporters without borders malta is on place 81 it's between hong kong and kyrgyzstan actually um, how do you see the freedom of press for all over Europe? Is Malta a special case or um, are there problems in other countries as well? There are problems in other countries. It's just that each, each one, um, I mean, I would say the root causes um, of these problems are similar, but the way they manifest themselves are different. So, for example, in Hungary, um, you have people close to Orban buying up the media and eliminating all competition and basically turning all Hungarian media into puppets of the government. Um, in most countries across Europe, you have the use of libel suits, or uh, what are called strategic lawsuits against um, public participation, SLAPs to silence journalists. This is a problem all over Europe. And in Malta, you have a situation where the government acts as though the, the media doesn't exist and acts as though the government is not answerable to the public and has absolutely no obligation to answer journalists' questions. Um, no government officials ever agree to interviews they don't even answer requests for interviews never answer requests for information bully journalists my brother was among a group of journalists who was who were locked in a room at the prime minister's office um it's almost impossible to get any information um under our country's freedom of information laws almost all our requests are denied there are increased levels of opacity in public registries, information is being taken online, information that was once public. So things are getting worse and worse in that regard. And one of the missions of the foundation is to fight back against that worsening atmosphere. Um, I think one key mechanism for changing that dynamic will be the public inquiry. Um, because it is looking into the atmosphere that was created that made my mother's murder possible. And I think that that atmosphere is still there and it, it manifests itself in the way the government deals with, deals with the media and deals with the public, um, which is disdainfully. Do you have um, concrete advice um, for journalists who cope with similar things as you do, with threats, with not um, getting in touch with the politicians? How do you, how do you keep up the work without um, being frightened? Yeah, it's just to, to focus on the work. I mean, at the end of the day, these things are, if not designed to stop you completely, um, to stop you doing the work you're doing as effectively as you did it before as or as effectively as you could do it um what what um the people who harass you want to do is put brakes on your work at the very least and the best way to react to that is to seek the help of um of press freedom organizations to work collaboratively with other journalists and to try and focus as much as possible on continuing to do your work. My mother said the year she was murdered that no matter how bad things are, we have to do our best to document what is happening 
even if it seems like our work leads to nothing because that documentation is going to need to be used later when there is an opportunity for change. And in fact, she was proved right because now three years after her murder, authorities are still using my mother's work as a source of information. Do you sometimes think when, um, when reporting kind of becomes a fight that there is the danger to, to lose objectivity? Yes, I mean, there, there is a danger of that. And once again, this is the objective of people who harass you to kind of trigger you into reacting in a way in which perhaps you shouldn't react and then use that to discredit you. It's a very well thought out strategy and it's very effective if you fall into that trap. Matthew, I think our time is up, but thank you very much for this open interview and um, good luck with the further investigation and um, with the freedom of press for all of us. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.